Next, we're going to talk about uh, disease, pests, management on crops and uh, on vegetables and fruits. And to do that, it's uh, other than, none other than Dr. Tracy Payton. Tracy, she's the assistant professor of horticulture and uh, crop and soil science at Langston. She's also the leader in the School of Egg and Applied Sciences. And uh, well, no. her specialization is in the areas of entomology, uh, greenhouse and field production, and uh, also uh, about biological control of horticultural insects. I always call her the bug lady, so you'll be honored to listen to her, and I'll pass it over to her. Thanks, James. Thanks for having me today. Um, so today I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about um, a very brief overview about some pests and disease to be um, on the lookout for as we get going with this gardening season. Um, so like James said, I am um, assistant professor of horticulture at Langston University. I'm also the crop and soil sciences program leader. Um, so basically I just advise the crop and soil science students um, and help them get internships, things like that. Um, so my current research right now is biological control, so using good bugs to kill bad bugs. Um, it's kind of my specialty. Um, but I worked in extension for 10 and a half years in Norman, um, answering consumer horticulture questions. So um, I was able to learn a lot in that, um, that respect as well. So I'm sorry. Oh, nice. So I don't have to use the computer if I don't want to. Okay, so this is gonna be real quick and dirty because I wanna leave um, some time for questions. I'll also, I don't think I'll be here tomorrow because unfortunately I have to teach class, but I will be here Thursday um, on the farm tour. So if you guys are at the farm tours and wanna talk and we don't get a chance to today, I'll be there, so. All right, so first off, I wanna talk about weed control. Weed's technically a pest, right? Do I need to get away? Am I feeding back? I'm sorry, okay. Right, I'm gonna stand right here, how about that? This is the front friendly side of the room. The podium? Okay, gotcha. Sorry. I like to move around a lot when I talk, so I apologize to the camera guy. Um, I will try and stay right here. <laughs> it's going to be really hard, though. Um, so when we talk about weed control, um, I kind of want to bring to your attention that there are two types of weeds that were, well, technically three types of weeds that we're really concerned about when we're talking about production outside. Um, and so first off, we're going to talk a little bit about these broadleaf weeds. And so for broadleaf weed control, typically um, you're trying to control them a little bit in the fall, especially for the cool season broadleaves. Those are the ones that we're really most concerned about. Of course, in our garden, we're always going to be hand pulling weeds and things like that. But um, if you decide you do need to spray or if you've got an area that you want to spray, um, 2,4-D is one of the most common um, pesticide or herbicides that we have out there um, for broadleaf weed control. And so they're called a broadleaf because they have broad leaves. They have net veined leaves. Okay. So that's how you kind of can quickly identify um, what you're trying to kill with a specific herbicide because you, it will help to know if it's a grassy or a broadleaf weed. Um, all of these products now contain dicamba. Um, and I just want to remind you that your trees, your tomatoes are all broad leaves too. So you really need to be careful with these products in and around things that you don't want to kill. Um, you have to be careful with thrift and different things like that. So just make sure um, tomatoes and grapes are especially sensitive to 2,4-D. And so um, if it travels on the wind 10 miles away, it can still sometimes affect these species. So um, so you have to be careful with the 2,4-D for sure. We typically want it applied early in spring when the weeds are smaller. So weed control is really all about getting an early jump on it. Um, you want to make sure that you're attacking those weeds right away. You want to get them before they set seeds, before they flower, before they start working on that next generation. You really either want to be spraying them or pulling them um, or doing some type of shallow cultivation or however um, you decide to take care of these weeds. Um, Typically, a lot of the broadleaves, the most common broadleaves, a lot of times, um, especially um, in a turf situation, they're going to tend to be more prominent during um, cooler temperatures. They're not those C4 grasses that we're concerned with that are really going to thrive in the summertime. So, um, and it's, it's better to spray these when it's cooler, you have less uh, vapor drift. Okay. Grassy weeds, of course, look like grasses, right? So this is another easy way to just kind of identify the difference between a broadleaf and a grass. Um, grasses tend to have parallel leaves. They have those strap-like leaves. 
they look like a grass, right? And so that's helpful if you have a grass in your lawn or in your garden and you're not sure what type of grass it is, you just know that it's a grassy weed and you want to kill it because you don't want it there, okay? <laughs> so they have parallel leaf veins, um, very common in, gra in glasses, uh, grasses. Um, typically, these guys are going to be thriving in the heat of the summer. Um, they are not going to be really limited by these hot temperatures. Um, so a lot of times um, we're, you know, trying to play catch-ups on some of these things. I will tell you the best time to apply a pre-emergent for broadleaf weed or for grassy weed control is right now. <laughs> so if you have sand burrs, if you have things like that, you really want to be applying it now. You can apply again in May. Uh, but the idea is to dry out those seeds with a pre-emergent uh, before you ever see them germinate. Okay, just be aware that if you're going out and seeding watermelon, that those seeds may not germinate with, germinate with the uh, pre-emergent seed control. Okay, um, typically you don't want to uh, irrigate after you apply, and then some of these weeds will take more than one application. Okay, so this might be where you decide to spray and then hoe or spray and then shallow till. You might incorporate several different methods. Um, do make sure that you're reading um, your... Um, product labels, the label is the law. Make sure that you're applying it in the correct location uh, for that product because sometimes you can use it in cut flowers, but you can't use it in vegetables or vice versa. So just make sure you're reading those labels really closely. Um, you don't want to kill that crop that you're growing for profit, right? Okay. Um, sedges are a little bit different. We say sedges have edges. A lot of people think of this as nut grass, okay? Um, and that is a sedge. Um, typically, these plants like it a little bit wetter. So a lot of times you'll have problems with sedges in a moi more moist area that holds a little bit of water. We like to say sedges have edges. So these blooms, when these guys bloom, um, that they're going to have triangular stems. And so that's, again, kind of another way to identify um, those nut grasses. Um, they're a little bit, when you see them out um, in a field, they look a little bit more lime green than a nice dark green like a crabgrass or Bermuda grass would. Um, so depending on if you have yellow or purple or both, there are different things that you can apply. I do recommend that you spray for nut sedge if you have a really big outbreak of it versus pulling it because it's called nut sedge for a reason. Each one of those little roots has a, what we call a little nutlet on it. And so when you pull, it pulls really easy. It pulls supremely easy because it's leaving 18 nutlets back in the ground to go ahead and sprout into more nut sedge. So this is one that particularly is a lot better to actually spray versus pull. Um, you would have to do a lot of pulling to really, to really make any headway here. Um, so when we're talking about sedge control, we're talking mostly a pro two products, image and sedge hammer. Okay. All right. So jumping right in, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about tomatoes. Um, we talked about weeds. Weeds are a pest. Diseases are, are considered a pest. Bugs are considered pests, right? Um, but the main disease that you're going to have an issue with in tomatoes is fusarium wilt. Now, um, there are some tomatoes that have built-in resistance. Does resistance mean immunity? Absolutely not. I think we we know that even more now with the pandemic, what resistance and immunity is. So it is best to um, buy those tomatoes that have F1 and F2 resistance for sure. It's also really good to rotate. Um, because this is a disease that really thrives in the soil and will build up in the soil, um, it is better to rotate those crops every year, deplete the amount of disease in that soil, and also as well plant those resistant varieties. So you're basically doubling up on your control at that point. Fusarium wilt um, is very common. You see it as manifesting as yellowing and browning from the bottom up, and it just kind of continues to progress, okay? Um, you may see this in certain varieties. You may see it a little bit more in heirloom varieties that may not have that built-in resistance. Should you stop growing them? Absolutely not. <laughs> but grow some other things too, right? Um, mix it up a little bit. Have some diversity. You don't just grow one variety of one thing. You get a disease and then you're done, right? Um, so diversity is key. Um, there's really not any control once you get this. Um, it is one of those that's more of a vascular disease, so it's going to be inside the plant. It's going to be hard to ta target with a, with a fungicide, okay? Um, and it will literally say on those plant tags, F1 or F2 resistance, okay? Um, 
But again, resistance doesn't mean immunity. There's still a chance that you could get this disease, especially if you've got a bunch of it in the soil, okay? Spider mites, super, super common, okay? They love tomatoes. This is characteristic spider mite damage here. Um, you can kind of see it's removed the green, right? So spider mites have really, really tiny mouth parts, and they eat that um, green parts off the leaf and kind of leave this white behind. What you'll see as this progresses, the foliage will almost get a bronze color as well. You may see netting or webbing at the juncture of uh, the leaves here, but you may not. Different, different species will web, others will not, okay? So webbing isn't always an indicator of spider mites. Um, this is a huge problem. Spider mites love hot and dry weather. They love, love, love hot and dry weather. Um, so you can get spider mites on just about anything in the summer, okay? But they do really like tomatoes. Um, so they thrive in hot uh, weather. They can be hard to control because they are so small. Um, they are a major issue in greenhouse situations where you've excluded a lot of the natural predators. Um, so in those types of situations, you may have to control a little bit earlier than you normally would outside just because you don't have those natural predators pr present. Okay. Um, spider mites have been targeted for, I don't even know how long, decades with a product called Kelthane. Okay. Um, it is one of those that did a really good job controlling um, the insect, but I don't believe that it's recommended much anymore. If you can even find it anymore, it may not be available. So our current recommendation are those insecticides that act what we like we call a mechanical control. Okay, and if you're familiar with IPM, you know what a mechanical control is. These soaps and oils physically either suffocate or break down the outer cuticle, the that, that, uh, epidermis, so to speak, of that insect. Okay, so what that means is it's, this insect is not going to develop resistance to this chemical formulation. It's one of those that if you get it on the insect, it's going to work. Okay, uh, but the problem with soaps and oils, horticultural soaps, uh, insecticidal soaps, is they don't last very long outdoors. Okay, so within 24 to 48 hours, that product is gone. It's not something that the insect can walk across and get a dose of, like some of our traditional pesticides. You have to physically get it on that insect, okay? So good coverage is key. Spray that plant until it's dripping. Spray it in the cool time of the day because soaps and oils can be volatile and can burn the plant, okay? Um, but this is one of those things that works pretty well for spider mites. Now, I've talked to James about this before. <laughs> He's kind of been on the receiving end when I get on my soapbox a lot of times. But with insect control, we are so used to thinking about eradication. We're so used to thinking about, I don't want even one insect on my plant. And that's very unrealistic, okay? It's about tolerance. It's about what level can you handle, okay? It's about controlling it to a point to where it's not going to affect your bottom line as much. But eradication really is not realistic, Okay. Um, you don't want, trust me, you don't want a sterile growing environment. <laughs> okay. You want to have those predators and pathogens there to help you along. Okay. So tolerance is key um, because you're never going to be er able to eradicate every single insect on your plant. Okay. Nor do you want to. Um, I would, I would question your spraying if you, if you have a sterile environment like this. Okay. Um, you can also, in early, early stages with aphids and spider mites, hit everything with the firmest stream of water you can. Think about it like power washing your plants, okay? If they can handle it, power wash your plants, okay? Knock them off. A lot of times they're dislodged to the point that they aren't going to find their way back, okay? Or they're harmed by the spray. So that's a really good first step. Um, if you have any pruning to do, that's another really good first step. Prune it off and then spray it. Remove some of that excess growth, okay? Um, but a hard stream, hard stream of water is a good first step, okay? There is an OSU fact sheet about uh, diseases and insects and tomatoes if you'd like more information. Questions? Go back. Go back? Okay. That's okay. And this is just through the OSU pod system, the print-on-demand system, where you can go search for fact sheets. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, at, so, and that is biological control at its finest, okay? Um, so there are predatory mites. Um, I want to say, I can't think of the name of them right now. Uh, it's a scientific name. It's not a, it's not a common name. 
Um, they're very good at their job, but most biological control agents are going to work before you have a full-blown epidemic. Okay, so introducing these things early to maintain low populations is better than if you are swarming with something, you introduce this natural enemy, it can't keep up. The reproductive levels are just not matched up. Um, your pests are always going to re reproduce faster, longer than a natural enemy would. Um, so yes. Um, they're very good at controlling, but you do have to release them early. You will have to make sure that you have some leaf overlap because spider mites don't have wings, so they have to crawl from plant to plant. Um, there are ways that you can distribute these spider mites. Um, they're shakers, or you can, a lot of people simply put it in front of their greenhouse fan and let them blow because they're really small. Um, but you have to make sure that those mites can move from plant to plant, so you kind of have to keep that in mind. Um, other questions? Yes. Yes. Right. So you could get potentially get a soil test to test to see if fusarium wilt is there, but I would bet you it's there. It's just a matter of the abundance of that um, fusarium that's there. I wouldn't really go to that length. I wouldn't recommend you to go test for fusarium in your soil. What I would recommend is doing some cover cropping, um, doing crop rotation. So rotating in that spot where you suspect you could have fusarium, doing a cover crop, you know, tilling it in this time of year or whatever, and then going in with something that's not even in the tomato family. Going in with something like a cucumber or onions or lettuce, something completely different to break that disease cycle. Yeah. It could be, it could be, um, but that's why rotation is so important. That's why buying resistant varieties is so important. And I know in a garden, like raised bed situation, there's only so much you could do. Um, you can try solarization as well. I don't know what effect that would have on that disease because it is a fungus. So if you think about where fungus thrives, it's kind of, you know, moist, boggy, things like that. Um, but yeah, crop rotation, resistant varieties, things like that. Now there are people that, will try and like dilute the soil in a raised bed. They'll add new garden soil or something like that. Um, and that might be kind of a Band-Aid, you know, to kind of get you through. Uh, but really crop rotation is going to be going to be your key. Yeah. Yeah. Provided you have the room to do that. Would yes. Mustard, mustard be a good cover crop? Sure. Yeah. 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 I know really you have to control the mustard gas when you do that. Right. Right. Sure, sure. Right. Yeah, and so mustard would be good because it has those natural compounds, those natural insecticidal type compounds. Um, if you can till it in and kind of, like you said, control that mustard gas, of course, that is going to help. Um, because it is a gas, it's going to have a tendency to just fly away, right? Um, so, but that, that would be an option. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, with crop rotation, I think once would be enough, as long as you're planning something different. But again, it comes back to monitoring that situation and going, okay, something's going on. Maybe I need to switch where I'm planting this. Yeah, yeah. It could, yeah, because most fungus are going to prefer a certain pH. And so anytime you change, because that's how a lot of our fungicides work. So a lot of times if you change that pH of that surface, you're not going to have as intense of an infection. Now with fusarium, I think it's passed within the plant. So again, I don't think it's something that you could spray the foliage with and get good control. Right, right. You could try that. Um, I would be concerned what else it's going to kill, though. Um, and if you, because there's good fungus too. So, you know, I would hate to tell you to do that and then you'd have, you know, an issue and not have all the good things in your soil that you would want. So, yeah. Other questions? Okay. Let's move on to stink bugs. I have these a lot in my garden. Okay. And a lot of times you may not actually see these insects feeding, but you see the results of their feeding. 
Okay. Um, so stink bugs, these are the little green insects or brown insects that stink when you push them or find them or crush them. Um, and they like to feed on the moisture inside the tomato. Okay. They are, they like to feed on worms, but when it gets hot and dry, they get thirsty too. And so they start probing your tomatoes. Um, they are predatory on other types of uh, worms and moths that aren't necessarily excuse me, aren't necessarily a problem in the garden, but that are going to be flying through, right? So you usually see an increase in stink bug when you see an increase in these moth flights, all right? Um, so they feed on the larvae of these moths. It's best to treat stink bugs when they're young, and this is what a young stink bug looks like. It's very different looking than the adult, okay? Um, they are not a huge issue, but they can affect marketability. Um, they can be, again, controlled with insecticidal soaps as well. Um, you want to make sure that it's early in the morning when the temperatures are still kind of low. This is the damage that we see from stink bug. So, again, you may not have seen that actual stink bug, but you've seen the damage, right? Um, the tomato is perfectly edible. These areas that are a little bit lighter in color may not be as tender, um, and it may not be as marketable. Okay. Um, like I said, I get these on my tomatoes every year, but I'm not a market gardener. I don't go sell anywhere, so I'm not too concerned with it. But insecticidal soap is something that you can use um, if you have this issue. Um, yeah. I always love it when I say everything that's on my slide and I don't miss anything. So <laughs> questions about stink bug. I wish I had a mature picture of them on here. Yes. Uh, the discoloration, if it's not damaged and it's still edible, how does it get that color? So they have basically taken their mouth part, uh -huh. probed that fruit, and gotten the moisture out. Okay, so and it causes that, that lesion. Okay, yeah. I didn't know. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Very, very common on tomatoes. Um, and depending on your infestation, it may be, you know, medium, inf mild infestation, or, or more uh, rampant. Okay. And this is something that, of course, the drier it is, the more of an issue we're going to have. Yes? Um, what would be, um, I think, because we have people online, so. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You want to hear this? Okay, the, sorry. Yeah, that's um, okay. Um, my question is, um, what is a good way to um, tackle the, stink bugs without chemicals? So insecticidal soap is an organic control. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, so it would be considered organic. So would some of the horticultural oils and things like that. Those are considered organic. They're not considered a traditional insecticide. Okay. <laughs> Since they're after the moisture in the tomato, could you set out pans of water throughout your tomato crop to attract them to water? I've done that before for birds. You could, yeah, you could try that. I mean, that'd definitely be worth a try. Um, the other insects would probably appreciate it too. Butterflies and things like that love shallow, <laughs> shallow dishes of water like saucers. Yeah, you could try that. Okay. And then if you saw them over there, you just take your flip flop and go, <laughs> go nuts, right? <laughs> Start squashing the, the bugs. I always gross everybody out, and Micah's probably going to laugh, but I always gross everybody out when I talk about my love of squishing insects um, because there's no coming back from it. I can spray it with an insecticidal soap. It may not die, but it's not going to die when it's pressed between these two things. So I love to squish bugs. I love the feel of a grub worm popping between my gloves. <laughs> Just it's so, so satisfying. Like it's. It's therapeutic. I swear it's therapeutic. All right. So this is another issue um, that we see with tomatoes is blossom end rot. And I probably have to speed up because we're getting low on time. Um, so blossom end rot happens when the tomato is growing so fast, the calcium does not go to the fruit. It goes to the leaves. And our soils, because they're clay soils, have a lot of micronutrients. So it's never a deficit of calcium in the soil. It's because of how fast that plant is growing, okay? And that, that nutrient is not being relocated where it needs to be. So what you have is that blossom end, that end that faces out is going to start rotting. And you can see this sometimes on watermelons, but it's very common on tomatoes and peppers. It's called blossom end rot. 
And so um, the way that you can do this is um, you can try and apply foliar calcium to see if that will help. Um, sometimes people say, well, eggshells, that might help as well. Um, typically what you want to do is shock the plant a little bit, though, um, and try getting it to the plant. So a lot of times, too, people will disturb the root system just a little bit or prune that plant back just a little bit, and sometimes that will help. Um, I don't know what the translocation does in that, that point, but um, that is an option. So typically what we're going to do here is just remove that affected fruit, um, try and even our watering out, make sure you're not, um, you know, putting a whole bunch in one day and then forgetting about it for a week, even out your watering, drip irrigation, all of those things will help prevent blossom and drought. Um, but it's technically not a lack of calcium in the soil. It's where it's going in the fruit. Okay. Questions? Good? Okay. Hold on, Micah. <laughs> does, it, does, it, does it seem to help whenever the plant grows to a more mature, um, the plant gets more mature? Yeah, I would think that it would probably be less of a problem on more established plants, you know. Um, those younger plants are probably going to, I'm guessing, would have more of an issue. So, yeah. Okay. So, when it gets hot, plants just can't pollinate as easy. Okay, um, they're not going to pollinate as easy. And so you may see when it gets really hot and dry, um, hopefully it's not going to be as dry, I don't know. Um, but when it gets really hot, you're going to see that your fruit production is pretty much going to cease on a lot of things. At that point, we're basically going to a maintenance situation to where we're either trying to just eke those plants through until those temperatures cease or we are moving along to a different type of crop. Okay. Um, so typically, plant, uh, tomatoes really like to flower between 60 and 70 degrees. Um, that is when they like to set fruit, okay? Is that the temperature that we typically have in the summer when we're growing tomatoes? No, okay? So um, when the day temperature reaches greater than 92 de de degrees, your fruit is going to start to taper off. Your fruit production is going to taper off. Um, if you've applied excess nitrogen, you're going to have um, a lack of fruit in the uh, plant because it's, gr it's focusing on putting on green leafy growth, not fruit set. Um, and blossom set spray, you can find these at Lowe's, Home Depot, places like that. These types of blossom setting sprays work better with low temperature, not high temperature blossom drop. Okay, so you may see some of your blossoms, your fruit blossoms drop off, and you may see a reduction in uh, fruit. This is, this is normal, okay? Um, what I like to say, I think it might be the next slide. No, it's not. I think it's in a, two, a couple of slides, but um, I will bring up again when to best ripen tomatoes. So uh, this is another abiotic problem. When I say abiotic problem, it's not caused by a disease or an insect. It's something that's non-living. So it's an environmental thing, okay? So another abiotic problem, um, this is actually a tomato. Does it look like a tomato? Kind of, maybe a little bit. Kind of looks like a Dr. Seuss plant to me. Okay. You've grown that tomato before, right? Uh, this is 2,4-D damage. Okay. So it will cause these plants to get twisted and gnarly and look like literally something out of the cat in the hat. A weird looking Dr. Seuss plant. Okay. Tomatoes are super sensitive. So are grapes. 2,4-D uh, can travel. Uh, it can vaporize in the right temperature. Um, so this is something that is very, very common. Um, it's hard to tell where it came from, though, especially on a windy day. It could have come from a mile or two away. So don't, don't necessarily go down to your neighbors knocking down their door and accusing them of spraying 2,4-D. Um, the plant will eventually probably succumb to this um, because it isn't a herbicide. It is going to kill those broadleaf plants. So if it's early enough, you can replant, um, and hopefully it doesn't happen again. All right. So if you have the ability to... It is best to allow, I see you, I'll get to you in just one second. Um, it is best to allow your tomatoes to ripen uh, indoors. Now, a lot of people say that's not a vine ripened tomato, and I would argue that it is because in one of those previous slides, we saw that tomatoes like to ripen between 60 and 70 degrees, which is most of our temperatures of our homes in the summertime, right? 
So if you can pick the tomato right at the first flush of color, right the first flush of yellow or purple or red, and ripen them indoors, what you're going to see, because everything likes to eat a ripe tomato, right? What you're going to see is you're going to have less cracking. You're going to have less bird damage. You're going to have less tomato fruit worm damage. You're going to have less damage overall. And you're actually ripening it in the conditions that this plant prefers. Okay? So I would argue that it is still a vine-ripened tomato. And it might actually have better flavor because you're providing the right conditions. Right? All right. So no bird damage, a lot of other damage, better color and flavor, some people argue. Um, okay. Let's talk about squash, cucumbers, watermelons, and cantaloupe real quick. The common problems. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Miss, you had a question. I just had a question about 2,4-D being yes. like mobile. You said it travels. Does it, is it mobile in the soil, or do we have to worry about water runoff? Or I don't it think it's drip? as mobile in the soil. I think it's more of, of and I'm not, a, I'm not a specialist on 2,4-D, but I think it's more of like an airborne gaseous kind of thing. Yeah. It was developed, so a lot of our insecticides came out of World War II, right? And this was one that came out of Agent Orange, okay? They noticed that it had, had some herbicidal uh, application, okay? Um, so this is called bacterial wilt. This happens on all your cucurbits if um, they, they basically wilt and they don't come back, okay? No amount of water is going to perk them up. Um, it is a bacterial infection. It is um, vectored by cucumber beetle, and I'm going to show a picture of that in a minute. But the indicator here is this wilting, okay? But that could be squash bugs. That could be something else. This is the indicator here. When you pull those two stems apart, there should be a gummy ooze between them. That is an indicator of bacterial wilt, not something else. Um, and it can happen um, in fields of watermelons and lots of different things, okay? Um, there's really not a lot of good treatment because, again, it is vascular. It's inside the plant at this point. So what you want to do is try and eliminate these guys. Um, so this is a cucumber beetle, right? This is our, the bane of our existence, the squash bug. Um, cucumber beetle is a vector for bacterial wilt, okay? So if you see these guys, there is potential they could be spreading this disease. Um, row covers, there's been a lot of research on using row covers for squash production to keep the squash bugs out until those plants have some growth on them and can combat those infestations a little bit better. Um, it's very labor intense though because you have to take these covers off or open them twice a day to allow pollinators in. Okay, so it is very labor intense, but that is an option. Um, a lot of people I know, a lot of growers I know, just stagger their plantings. And once one section is dead, they rip it up and they move to the next one. Okay, um, if you're going to try and control squash bug, you have to do it when they look like little gray ticks. Okay, once they become adults, they can survive an A-bomb. It's just not, there's, there's nothing you can do for them once they look like this. Um, there are some people that will put plywood out in their garden overnight Squash bugs like to congregate, um, and so a lot of times you can put plywood out between your rows at night, go out early in the morning in your robe with a cup of coffee, and take out the old flip-flop again. Um, so, yeah, or vac you can vacuum them, too. There's lots of, I mean, use your Dyson if you want, but there's other insect vacuums, too. Um, so, yeah, these guys are horrible, um, but you have to control them when they're young because adults, nothing will kill them. Um, you can use neem, endosulfan, uh, permethrin, pyrethrin, and soaps and oils are options for these guys when they're young. Okay. Uh, squash vine borers, another issue sometimes in our plants. Um, you can see here it's kind of got this orange sawdust at the bottom of the, the base of the plant. Um, a lot of people uh, will, when they plant their squash, they will mound the soil up around that stem to the first leaf, and that's supposed to help encourage those lateral, lateral roots, and so it's harder for that squash to, to um, penetrate that where the roots are coming out instead of just bare stem. Um, so that's an option. A lot of people will plant their squash with a, a pencil or um, a tomato, or not tomato, toilet paper roll around it. Um, so anything that can kind of keep that stem uh, intact and keep them from boring into it will help. But you can see here that the symptoms look a lot like bacterial wilt. So it helps to know some of these distinctions between these things. 
Uh, once you get squash fine bore, there's not a whole lot that you can do unless you want to get in there with an X-Acto knife and a paper clip and pull them out. It's really labor intense. Um, but there's not a lot you can do once they penetrate into the plant. You can try to spray BT, um, dipel dust, um, before you have an issue, especially around the stems. If you have an issue over and over, you can try and spray that BT to keep them at bay. But once they're in, there's not a whole lot that can help. All right. All right, just remember that aphids, this is my friendly little aphid right here, having an aphid, okay? Uh, aphids don't need males to reproduce, so go girls. Um, but they are born with five generations inside of them. And that's why they can go from 1,000 to 1 million, literally overnight. Um, but aphids and spider mites can attack just about anything in your garden. So just be aware of that, okay? Um, let's talk about fruits real quick, because James wanted me to talk about fruits. I got five minutes. So we're going to talk about uh, poems. Poems are apples, Asian pears, pears. Uh, quince, things like that. Um, they really only have one issue, and it's worms, okay? Uh, worms and uh, rust, which I'm going to show you here in a minute. Um, when you're growing fruit, you want to get on a spray schedule. Every 10 to 14 days, you're spraying for insects, for a fungus, okay? A lot of times you're doing a tank mix, but typically every two weeks, um, if you don't want... Um, worms in your peaches or your apples. You're going to have to get on a regimented spray schedule. Um, so codling moth is the big problem in apples. Plum curculio is our problem in peaches, but it can also be a problem on apples sometimes. And again, you just have to get on this spray schedule. OSU has a really good fact sheet on apple um, and peach spraying, I believe. There's a really nice color schedule. Um, so you can kind of see when to control what. Okay. This is cedar apple rust. You've probably seen this on our eastern red cedar. Um, it's very common um, during the wet spring and fall. You can see different um, levels of this fungus. Um, this would be those active teleospores. And this is what it looks like on apple. It looks like a bullseye. Okay, so again, this is going to be controlled with a fungicide application. When you're talking about fungicides, fungicides are preventative at best. You want to spray them before you have a full-blown problem. That is not the case with pesticides. We're monitoring for pests, right? We're looking for them. But with fung fungicides, you want to get them on before you have a full-blown problem to protect it, to keep that fungus from spreading, okay? So that's what we do on cedar apple rust. We don't spray the cedars. It's not worth it. There's too many of them, and you would be not doing anything else again. Um, but you spray it on apples when it looks like this, okay? Don't plant apple trees near cedars. Okay, yeah, that's easy, right? In Oklahoma, all right, Maneb and Mancazeb is a good option for homeowners. Again, this is a picture I took when I lived in Norman. It was a whole road, absolutely blazing orange. It was insane. All right, got to go quick. Here's peaches. This is scab. Again, you need to be on a spray schedule every 10 to 14 days. They can also suffer from brown rot and plum curculio, which is a worm. Um... For scab you would and brown rot, you would be applying a fungicide. For plum curculio, it's an insecticide. Okay, They can also get bacterial wilt as well, but that would be a resistant variety issue. This is peach leaf curl. We see this a lot on older varieties. The, the leaves just look curled and gnarly. Um, you want to spray now if you have a trouble with this, and that should uh, control it uh, for you with lime sulfur, which is a common fungicide. All right. Peach tree borer, sharpen your axe if you see this. Okay, you've already got an issue. The peach tree borers are there. They have bored in. The plant is weeping. It's only a matter of time. Um, best case scenario, peach trees are about an eight-year tree in our area anyway, so you're going to have to replant them fairly often. Um, there's not a whole lot of products available for homeowners in this case, so make sure you've got your spraying license. All right, so healthy plants are more able to withstand disease and pest pressure. Okay, so again, it's about tolerance. It's not about eradication. It's about finding that happy medium. Um, but the healthier your plants are, the better off they're going to be fighting these infections, fighting these issues. So soil testing, proper fertilization, proper pruning, all of these things um, beforehand will help you out later on. Okay. Um, 
So make sure that you're pinching off dead plants, you're throwing out dead plants, you're keeping everything san sanitized as best you can. All right, whew, it's quick. Questions? I think I have like one minute. Yes. I had a question on the uh, squash vine borer and the yes. BT. Yes. Um, I, I, I have a huge concern when I'm spraying BT about how long it, it, it'll be active to where a bee could, or a butterfly could be harmed by it. Okay. Do you, so I, I, I had some success with the injecting of the BT last year. I had saved some squash plants, but I, it, it feel, it's a labor intensive, just like okay. the razor blade. But sure. Do you know about that time frame with the how long it would affect right. bee populations and such? So the great thing about BT is it only, especially if it's something that you're spraying for caterpillars, it's BT uh, Kerstaki, I believe, is the active strain. And it is only specific to moth and butterfly larvae. You could eat it. I could eat it. Cats could eat it. Birds can eat it. They're not going to have an effect. And not so, even bees? Mm -mm. Wow. No, no, no. Um, so it is, it is a very, very particular strain of bacteria that shows an issue with these moths and butterfly caterpillars. And I haven't seen anything that, that argues that. So um, it's very, very specific. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Does cedar rust, will it affect figs? Cedar apple rust, yes, probably. Um, it would depend on the strain. With, fung with fungus, they're the strains are usually very specific to the types of plants that they affect. Um, but they could. It could be a type of rust, even if it's not cedar apple. Okay. Yeah. And the western conifer seed bug. Okay. Does it, actually, does it attack vegetable plants like squash bugs? Because the past two or three years, they have almost taken over tomato crops. Okay. I have not heard of the Western seed bug, so this is new to me. Okay. Um, maybe I'm out of the loop since I left OSU, but they look I identical have to a squash bugs, but they have huge hind legs and they actually will fly. And they're okay. kind of temperamental. You fly, walk through your tomatoes, and they'll fly at you and hit you. And okay. Yeah. Are you talking about wind bugs? No, they look just like squash bugs, except they have long um, hind legs. Okay. And they attack conifer trees. Okay. That's horrible, but how cool. Yeah, yeah, I've never, I will look that up, and I will let you know, okay? Western conifer seed bug was the name of it. Western conifer seed bug, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I would think that if it liked evergreens, it wouldn't be a natural crossover, but you never know, so I, w I would have to look into that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and it's not the box elder bug or anything like that that we're, okay. Because those, okay, they did, okay, yeah, yeah. Because um, the box elder bug is a seed feeder too, but it's usually like native trees and stuff, so, yeah. Oh, I got to go. Time's up. I'll be hanging out if you guys have any other questions. Um, just let me know. So.